Hey everyone, my name is Alyssa Kimball and I'm a PGY1 here at USF and today we're going to be talking about hyperkalemia. There are three things that I want you to remember from this lecture. Number one, is a patient unstable or stable and when should we get help? Number two, what are some of the ECG changes you see in a patient with hyperkalemia? And number three, what are the treatments that we give a patient who has hyperkalemia? So you're on house officer shift and you get a call that the patient has a potassium of greater than five. The first question we want to answer is, is the patient stable or unstable? The way that we're going to do this is talk to the nurse. We want to make sure that we get a, a story of how the patient's feeling right now and then ask for the vitals. At this point in time, it's appropriate to ask for an EKG as well so that when you see the patient, it's ready for you to evaluate. When the, pa when the nurse gives you the story, Make sure you find out, is the patient having symptoms? Are they responsive? Is there some evidence of altered mental status right now that may be telling us this patient is unstable? Other things that you want to look at, is the patient really tachycardic in the 150s or 160s where you're concerned that they may already be in an arrhythmia? And then is the patient hypotensive where they're no longer perfusing their organ systems and we may need to call for help, um, take a, a initial take excessive um, interventions in order to help them. In these kind of states, if you think the patient is unstable, make sure you call your senior, call the ICU, call the CCU and ask for help. If you think that the patient's stable, we move down this next line. The real question next is, is this a true value? We know that potassium shifts in and outside of cells within our body and sometimes what we see in the lab isn't a true value. Some ways that we can tell this. First, we wanna look on the lab. Does it say that there's evidence of lysis of the cells? We know that when patients get traumatic sticks, when the lab stays out for too long, when there's fish clenching, it can potentially lead to a high level in the blood that's not a true value that you would want to treat. There are some other circumstances where you have a high potassium that you wouldn't want to treat, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Whether or not the patient has a true hyperkalemia, you want to make sure that you see the patient. When you see the patient, it's important that you're taking a a thorough history, make sure you chart check them, take a look to see if there are any chronic conditions or comorbidities that may be contributing to their hyperkalemia, and then based on that you'll be able to direct your treatment and then subsequently follow up to determine if the potassium is resolving or stable over time. One of the things that I want to talk about, when you first see a patient and you evaluate them, you want to take a look at that ECG that you already asked for. Some of the signs that we see of hyperkalemia on an ECG are peaked T waves, which you can see on this drawn out ECG here, the PQRS T, it looks like a pointed edge, something that you would not want to sit on, loss of the P wave, and a wide PR or QRS. You'll note that over time, the EKG may change as the hyperkalemia gets worse or as time moves on, and it may develop from these signs to a sine wave like you see here and eventually to a fatal arrhythmia. That's why it's important to treat hyperkalemia quickly. I'm going to talk about the treatments and then we'll go through the differential after. So the big thing I want you to remember with potassium treatment is to see a big drop in potassium. The, one of the most important things when you first see the patient is to determine if you see any signs on an EKG, you want to give them calcium gluconate. Calcium gluconate does not lower the potassium at all. It only works to stabilize the cardiac membrane. If you start seeing signs of peak T waves, loss of P, or wide PR or QRS, you want to make sure that you give the patient calcium gluconate as soon as possible. The other treatments that we give patients who have hyperkalemia are albuterol, bicarbonate, insulin and or IV fluids, glucose, diuretics, more specifically furosemide or bumex, emergent dialysis if necessary, and potassium binders, which you may commonly known as K-exalate. The important thing to know about K-exalate is it will take a couple of hours to work. So it's one of the treatments that can help to lower potassium, but you may want to consider it in conjunction with these other treatments here. So let's talk about the differential. One of the contributors to 
uh, hyperkalemia is renal failure. It can either be acute renal failure or chronic renal failure because patients who have renal failure cannot excrete potassium. In these kind of cases, you may be considering something like emergent dialysis. Um, one thing that's really important to know in patients with renal failure is treatments like diuretics may not be appropriate as a lot of patients with renal failure can no longer urinate or kidneys have poor function and don't respond well to diuretics. Another important thing in, to consider for patients with hyperkalemia is DKA. In DKA, you're going to have a shift of your potassium, and although the extracellular potassium will appear to be elevated, your total body level of potassium is actually low. This is a case where you want to treat the underlying condition in order to resolve the hyperkalemia, but you don't want to try to reduce the potassium in itself. What I mean by that is that you want to give these patients insulin and IV fluids, which will help bring the glucose into the cell and excrete the glucose from the body, but you don't need to give any of these other treatments. And in a case where you have DKA, since their blood sugar is going to be so high, you will not be giving glucose along with the insulin. Some of the other differentials we worry about are an acidosis, tumor lysis syndrome, rhabdomyolysis or trauma, other drugs, more specifically ACE inhibitors, ARBs, spironolactone, amylaride, or beta blockers. And then finally, low levels of aldosterone, for example, Addison's disease, where patients will have hyperpigmentation and hypotension. So we talked about a lot today. I want to make sure we go over those last important things that you need to know. Number one, when to call for help if you think a patient is stable or unstable. The most important things that you'll see on ECG in patients with hyperkalemia are peaked T waves, loss of P waves, widened PR and QRS, and the treatments for hyperkalemia, you need to see a big drop in potassium, so calcium gluconate to stabilize the cardiac membrane, which will not lower the potassium, or the Drugs that are used to lower the potassium, albuterol, bicarbonate, insulin and IV fluids, glucose, diuretics such as Bumex or furosemide, dialysis, and potassium binders like k -exalate.